Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. Every so often, I like to kick back and do something a little different with the show. Something to break up the tech heaviness where we can both just relax and listen to a story. This is especially good when life gets busy, which it often does around this time of year for public librarians. By this time, summer reading programs are well within sight. Bad craziness swirls around us as we prep for summer events, special contests, celebrations, displays... And if you happen to be a library web guy, all kinds of digital stuff needs to get done. Beyond the summer reading insanity, I'm writing this at approximately 30,000 feet on my way from Phoenix to Washington, D.C., where I'll be speaking at the Computers and Libraries Conference. So if you're wondering why the show is late, it has a lot to do with the fact that it's hell to record a podcast on an Airbus A321 passenger jet. I mean, the acoustics are just all wrong. Besides, the first episode of the year was all about goals, and I'd like to follow up on one of my loftier goals in a big way. See, I wanted to get my third book done, published, and on Amazon by mid-February. I confess I was a little late, but I'm happy to announce that it is done, and it was ready at the beginning of March. It's called Digital Outback, Cyberpunk and Culture on the Edge of the Net. I'll have a link in the show notes if you want to buy it, but I figure you might want to sample it. After all, it might be crap. It's certainly a possibility because, after all, I wrote it. So here's a little celebration of my own, pre-summer reading. A couple of chapters with some beautiful music from some excellent down-tempo and ambient musicians. If you're driving, take another sip of coffee or two to stay awake because... We're about to get relaxed in a way so familiar to librarians around the world. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, Episode 43, Digital Outback. Let's have a story time. Finding Online Immortality I never had a chance to see Homer and Jethro perform live and in concert. It could have something to do with the fact that Henry Haynes, a.k.a. Homer, the rhythm guitarist half of the duo, died five years before I was born. Kenneth Burns, better known as Jethro, lived until 1989, but you can't really have Homer and Jethro without Homer. It was vinyl that gave me my first exposure to these two funny guys who played silly tunes decades before Weird Al Yankovic appeared on the scene. Grooves cut in plastic, read by a diamond needle that rustled along the peaks and valleys of the record. You can't get much more analog than the physical nature of what makes a record work. But maybe I should back up a second and explain who and what I'm talking about. Homer and Jethro were two musicians who parodied popular country tunes from the 1940s on into the 60s when their popularity started to wane. In that time, they entertained audiences on radio, television, and through records with their, quote, educated hillbilly nature, which was born of the fact that they were both jazz musicians, not country singers. Jethro played mandolin better than some of the greatest people in bluegrass, and Homer has a style with rhythm guitar that I rarely see anymore. They're a classic duo, and since they were part of my growing up, I feel a certain nostalgia for them, even though half of the group died years before I was born. We live in an era unlike any other before, 
For the most part, you can call up a video on demand of almost anything you want. You can listen to a song, any song, with just a couple of clicks. You want to watch that latest episode of Game of Thrones? You can do that. Want to watch the first episode of CSI Miami? It's available somewhere. Want to read a book on your e-reader and fold that into your archive of hundreds of books on that e-reader? No problem. You missed an episode of your favorite television program? Actually, you didn't. You remember to set, you remember to set that DVR to record it a few days ago. You can watch it this weekend, along with all the other shows you digitally recorded during the week. But there was a time before this, and it wasn't all that long ago, that if you missed an episode of your show... You missed it. It was gone. Maybe you caught it in reruns later that year, but that was a matter of luck. You could go to the cinema and catch a movie, and maybe you enjoyed that movie. Maybe it became your favorite movie. You could go see it again, but when it left the cinema, it too was gone. Unless they screened it later, it wasn't unusual to never see a given movie again. Video cassettes, DVDs, Blu-rays, they didn't exist. What's worse is that so many things from this not-so-bygone era are gone. They've disappeared. They may have been destroyed, erased, overwritten, or just thrown away. The human race has a nasty habit of not taking care of our culture because, in many ways, we don't know that we're making culture when we're making it. The original episodes of Johnny Carson's Tonight Show gone. The earliest episodes of Doctor Who, so many have been lost. London After Midnight, a horror movie starring the great Lon Chaney, disappeared. Hell, NASA and the United States lost the original recordings of the moon landings. Turns out they regularly erased the tapes for reuse later, and no one thought that one of the greatest events in the history of civilization might be worth hanging on to. A while back, some of the lost Doctor Who episodes surfaced in Nigeria. Some of the lost moon landing tapes were found, at least in a copied form. The original tapes of Monty Python's Flying Circus were saved at the last minute when Terry Gilliam, a former member of the legendary comedy team, bought the master tapes just before the BBC wiped them. There's hope, and miracles occasionally happen. What's worse is, when something is lost, then found... But then we discover that the content is stored upon unreadable media. The technology needed to read the media has also been lost, or there's not a single working version of it anywhere in the world. I had to wait until I was in my 30s before I ever got to see, you know, one of my favorite musical comedy acts perform live. By that point, both of them were gone, and with them, my ability to ever see them perform. Thankfully, because someone thought to save some of those television programs, I was able to watch them. And it was amazing. See, any music fan will attest to you that you get so much more when you watch the musician do their thing. I knew that Henry played a mean rhythm guitar. But watching him, man, there is more to it than him just playing rhythm guitar. It's how he did it so effortlessly. And death row. Goodbye, ma'am. We gotta scram down the highway. Stick out to thumb you some gun going my way. I got a ride with a guy in a white in a sack. Did you know that he chewed gum most of the time he was on stage? Henry would put it in the side of his mouth while singing, but when Kenneth picked up the solo on the mandolin, Henry provided backing rhythm and chewed gum. Roddy Piper came to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and he was all out of bubblegum. Henry came to chew bubblegum and to play guitar, and he brought extra gum just in case. I didn't know that, because you can't see that when you're just listening to the record. We achieved a kind of immortality when the human race learned how to write. Writing passes down thoughts, ideas, and knowledge through the eons and on to today. We have clay tablets from Mesopotamia that are over 5,000 years old. Yet we can read them, and because of that, we can summon a part of the author through the centuries and bring their thoughts with them. We did it again when we discovered how to record audio and video. 
Bela Lugosi is dead. Bauhaus has assured me of this for years now. Yet, I can see him right now if I want to. All I need to do is find him, and he's not hard to find. I can even find Lon Chaney because someone recorded him. But I can't find all of him. London after midnight seems to be utterly lost to the mists of a semi-recent time, an artistic expression of our culture gone to apathy, misadventure, or plain old-fashioned stupidity. What survives today does so through a rather new process of achieving immortality. Digital conversion. When you have a file, a digital file, you can manipulate it far more easily than you could anything else. Dubbing a vinyl record to tape, well, that takes time and special equipment. Converting an old record to CD is a pain in the ass. Converting a WMV, a Windows Media Video file, into a more portable MP4 format, that takes seconds and requires little in the way of special equipment. Chances are, if you have the equipment to watch the WMV file, namely a computer, you already have all you need to convert it. Programs like VLC will save it in another format. You can convert files in bulk. You can strip the audio off and make a separate file from that because you want to listen to it on your personal media device. All you need is software. From there, we turn to a final method of immortality, which could actually be the first way we discovered to live forever. We share. We live in a world where, as long as we can play the thing back or read the thing at all, we can digitize it, and it never needs to disappear again. It can be copied out to thousands of sites. It can be backed up. It can be converted and ported to different things. Floppy disks went out of fashion, so we put things on CD. CDs faded out, so we put things on flash drives. Now we can store it online in a cloud drive and make it more accessible and more widely than ever before. So long ago, many years before Henry Haynes died, someone pointed a camera and a microphone at him and his partner Kenneth, and they pressed a red button. Performances were recorded on the media of the time, just like we do today. Today I shoot video on a camera with a solid-state drive. Back then, it was magnetic tape. These recordings of Homer and Jethro survived, and someone with a computer finally got their hands on them, decades later. They fed the recording into the computer, converted analog content into digital, and then they did what millions of people do every day with digital video. They uploaded it to YouTube. All of the knowledge on the planet is worthless until it's shared. That's one of the many reasons I found myself working in a library, because knowledge is power, and while it may sound idealistic, power to the people, man. In the end, Homer and Jethro didn't live for years beyond their death, because someone recorded a performance. I wasn't able to watch them because someone converted that recording into a digital format. I was able to, finally, after over 30 years of fandom, watch them play live, because someone shared that file. Homer and Jethro, Bela, Lon, they all died before the internet. But we can experience them today through the various methods used by humanity to keep people alive even after they're gone. After all, all of them are important, but not as important as that last one. Remember someone or something today, someone or something that's gone. Then remember that it's not completely gone because you know about it. And then finally, keep it alive. Share it. When we sing, it sounds just like a cat and dog fight. But we don't sing for money, just for Are these thoughts illusions? 
If there is any one reason I love the internet, it's because of the discovery. The fact is, I have discovered so much simply because someone shared it. World Order is no different. It started with an animated gif of Japanese guys in business suits dancing robotically, but in a way I hadn't really seen before. Robot dancing styles are nothing new, but the fact that there were more than a couple, indeed there were seven, dancers was something different. They had their presentation tight and their moves were amazing. And they're Japanese guys in business suits. The GIF was presented without context, as a funny thing on Reddit. Thankfully, because it was on Reddit, there was someone there to provide the context which I desired so badly. The commenter pointed out that this was a sort of Japanese techno group called World Order, and the dance was from a music video for a song called Machine Civilization. You could check it out on YouTube. Naturally, I did. Then I spent the next hour or so watching and listening to anything World Order I could find, and, because it's the internet, I could find a lot of it. As things go, Machine Civilization is a perfect introduction to World Order because it sets you up for much of the group's underlying themes. There's a positive message throughout their work, and a recurring idea of We Are All One that's pervasive in their music and their videos. You get a feel for the flavor of the group, and how they're serious about what they're doing without taking themselves too seriously. It was enough to prompt some research into the whole thing and see what this was about. The first fact stunned me, and then everything else seemed to fall into place from there. I've never claimed to be normal, and while I dislike violence, I enjoy professional fighting. I love boxing, martial arts, Muay Thai, and mixed martial arts. I don't jump up and down while shouting, hit him, drive him into the floor, but a beer and a fight is a good time in my world. So it surprised me that I didn't recognize the lead singer of World Order. He didn't look familiar. But then I'm not used to seeing Pseudo Genki wearing glasses and the garb of a salaryman. Pseudo is a retired mixed martial arts champion, and I've seen him fight many times. During his MMA career, he was known for lavish entrances with music and lights and choreography something you'd see in professional wrestling rather than serious MMA. From wearing a KFC helmet that blew its stack to dance moves he'd later utilize as the frontman for World Order, everyone knew when Pseudo Genki was approaching the ring. Likewise, his unorthodox approach to fighting, like actually having fun while doing it, led to many opponents underestimating him. They thought he was a clown, an idiot. They usually change their minds after waking up on the mat, or just about the time Pseudo locked in a submission hold. Another piece that fell into place was the We Are All One philosophy laced into the workings of World Order. More than once, Pseudo displayed a banner bearing the same words in the ring after a victory. Maybe all of this sounds strange, or even a little too television mystic for you. Is he reflecting a Kwai Chain Kane character, or is he for real? Is this another game? No. He's a practicing Buddhist. He's absolutely serious. So in 2009, we have a Japanese prize fighter and Buddhist who retires from the ring and creates a music project. Why not? Along with six other guys, Sudo continued the spirit of showmanship he displayed in the ring. It was something new. An ex-fighter who sings techno and dances with slick robotic choreography and sings about, oh my god, peace, harmony, and happiness. The entire thing struck me as a weird amalgam of something straight out of a cyberpunk book, though the reasons might make sense only within my head. Nevertheless, I think there's a social commentary in World Order that lends itself well to cyberpunk-related entertainment. The concept of a street samurai was there from the beginning. Molly Millions in Gibson's Sprawl trilogy was the prototype from which all cyberpunk street warriors were built. She's everything we expect in a street samurai. Intelligent, cunning, adaptive, suspicious and occasionally ruthless. Interesting, because those are some highly desirable traits of a business person, too. Pseudo is a fighter who is taking on the worlds of business and government on his terms, all the while dressed in their garb. In another video, Permanent Revolution, World Order brokers peace between Asian powers, Japan, China, and Korea, come to terms that allow them to work together under Pseudo's banner of We Are All One. 
Yet there's a looming specter threatening the new peace, and oh look, he's obviously American. As an American, I find it maddening that I have to look so far outside of my country to find out what people elsewhere think of it. I cannot, in mid-2014, deny their visions of the United States as a power-hungry giant out for its own purposes. The overhanging vulture that is the USA cares little what happens in the world, so long as the results are beneficial to the USA. Looking deeper at World Order's choreography, I see another commentary, this time upon the world of business. I do not think it's accidental that World Order portrays businessmen moving in lockstep and in a robotic fashion. Returning for a moment to the stage of international governance, business and legislation are so cozy together that they no longer see any need to hide the relationship. Corporations rule the world, yet another foundation of cyberpunk fiction and the circumstances we inhabit today. The robotic nature and passive expression of World Order's suits and ties parodies the corporate world with its three-piece suits and unfeeling outlook. If you watch anime or Japanese pop cinema, you'll notice a recurring disaster, something relatively absent from American cinema. Japan has this nasty habit of getting destroyed. There are deep psychocultural reasons for this, but at its heart, Japan is the only nation in the world to have a nuclear weapon used against it in anger. So, it's not accidental that the methods of destruction revolve around the unleashed power of the atom whether it be a bomb or unintended consequences of nuclear radiation like kaiju monsters and Gojira, a.k.a. Godzilla. The threat and effects of nuclear disaster is prominent with the Japanese pop culture. Yet Japan rose from the ashes of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and this too is a common theme in anime and cinema. Neo-Tokyo, newer, larger, metropolitan Tokyo, is often literally built upon the ruins of Tokyo. Depending on the storyline and setting, it's possible that the two intersect and characters explore the ruins of old Tokyo. This characteristic flows through cyberpunk too, most notably in the seminal cyberpunk anime Akira. In an unexpected parallel, world order finds itself in similar circumstances. Machine Civilization is their biggest hit to date, and it was produced just after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and the resulting tsunami. Unfortunately, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station was directly in the path of the oncoming tsunami, and the consequence was another real-life atomic disaster for the island nation. As Japan struggled and continues to rebuild, Sudo created the song to encourage people to work together to change in a positive manner. He writes on the music video's YouTube page, The world is not going to change. Each one of us will change. And if we do, then yes, the world will be changed. It is darkest right before the dawn. Let's all rise up to welcome the morning that will be so very bright for mankind. The sentiment is echoed in the lyrics. The last part translates to, will this world be able to change? Are these thoughts illusion? Deep within the plot lines of cyberpunk, there is rebellion. Of course there is. That's the punk part of cyberpunk. That rebellion is there because hope exists. People who deride cyberpunk for its darkness fail to see its light, because at the core of the genre there is a belief that the system can be fought and things can be better. The Buddhist ideal of we are all one may seem foreign to the cyberpunk outsider, but it's an intrinsic part of the story. No matter where you are, everyone is always connected, says Iwakura Lane, the title character of Serial Experiments Lane. Artificial intelligence constructs like Wintermute and Neuromancer, or the puppet master of Ghost in the Shell, are quite literally born from the interconnectedness, the oneness of all things. Cyberpunk references and ramblings aside, World Order is definitely worth checking out, even if you don't speak Japanese, 
There's a playfulness in their music that makes it fun, regardless of a so-called language barrier. It's the age of the internet, so translations and lyrics are a search engine away. We are, after all, interconnected. And that is about it for this episode of Cyberpunk Library, and I hope you are a little bit more relaxed than you were when you came into the episode. And hey, even if you don't buy the book, I really don't care. I hope you at least enjoyed the couple of stories there from, you know, a couple chapters out of that book and the music that went along with it. And speaking of the music, after all, you are listening to Belly Dance of the Bisu by Ryo Miyashita, a song that I used to open the episode and occasionally close the episode as well. Earlier in the show, you heard Astro, Give You All I Can, and Parisian Girl, both by Geo. Links in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. And along with that, of course, we had to have some uh, clips from Homer and Jethro, a classic of theirs called Jambalaya, and World Order's Machine Civilization from the album 2012. Check that out. There's links in the show notes to pick them up on Spotify and YouTube, and I'm sure you can find them in other places as well. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Folks, the Internet Archive has some of the greatest stuff online, and if you don't believe me, well, you have to check out this link that I'm going to put in the show notes to their Pulp Magazine Archive. And I'm looking at it right now, and this is some incredible stuff. They've got Pulp Magazines from the 30s, the 40s, probably even before, and they're available to read online or download or, you know, you can read on your own device. And they're great. This is stunning work. So, I mean, they've got pulp science fiction, pulp fantasy. They've got pulp western and mystery. They've got all kinds of stuff. And, you know, if you check it out for nothing else other than the cover art, it's worth it just for that. So, the archive, saving and preserving the internet and hosting podcasts like this and things that are absolutely not like this at all, like, say pulp magazines you gotta check it out if you would like to get in touch with me well i would certainly like to hear from you and offer you multiple channels to make this kind of thing happen you can always hit me up on twitter i am at librarian it's like librarian but it starts with a b and you can also check us out on facebook at facebook.com slash cyberpunk librarian where I don't post as often as I'd like, but at least you can find out what's going on with the show and things like that. And you can always pick me up on Google+, Plus, where I am, google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. Or finally, if you want to do things the old SMTP method, I'm cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. This episode will also be available on YouTube for those who like to get their audio on through a video medium. No judgments here, because hey, I listen to a lot of music on YouTube with it just running in the background. You can always check the show out there at youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. But with that, I think it's time to get out of here. I thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. I will see you on the next episode of the show. But for now, just remember, you don't have to be high tech to be low budget. It just certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care now.